Uh, so welcome uh, everyone to um, our latest gas bag session. Now, I think the last time we ran one of these, uh, and at the time it was very popular and the intention was to run them regularly, was at least 10 years ago. Uh, but anyway, here we are in a brave new world running the next one. And we promise uh, that we'll try and get around to running these uh, bi-monthly. Does that mean twice a month or every two months? But anyway, the intention is to run them uh, every two months. Um, now, so there's a bit of chatter going on in the Q&A session, which is excellent because the idea of the gas bag sessions is that they are relatively unstructured and relatively informal. Uh, and that's why it takes two of us to run it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's starting already, it's good. Uh, so that's why it takes two of us to run it. So obviously I'm on here and you can hear me and most of you heard me before. Uh, my partner in crime here is Pooja Sadikan, who is over in Melbourne and unfortunately locked down due to the COVID restrictions over there. But as you can see, he's quite healthy and thriving over there, stuck in his office at home. Um, now, you will have known, if you don't, if you haven't seen or spoken to Pooja, you'll know Pooja, uh, many of you via email, uh, answering your questions and requests and fixing things for you, etc. Although Pooja and I are on the line live, uh, I think just about the entire rest of the gas team, including the devs, um, are also all listening into this session to learn uh, from the questions you're going to ask us on the way through. Uh, now, why do we call it gas bag? Well, I went, I wasn't actually sure whether gas bag was an Australian English, English, English or American English term. Uh, so I thought I'd better put it up there just to explain what it is. Uh, windbag, pompous, talkative, bloviator. So we don't want to be bloviating uh, too much during this session. Hence the emphasis uh, that please ask questions uh, on the way through in that chat window as you're doing now. And I'm going to try and keep an eye on it, um, especially when Putra takes over and starts demonstrating some of the interesting things in gas that you may not have seen in the past. Uh, while he's doing that, please just launch in and ask any questions you like, and I'll try and answer them way through. Uh, we would rather not save this up to the end and do a QA. and a We want to get them out as we go, uh, because we we will get to the end of the hour fairly quickly, and we have a hard end because Putra needs to go off and do his MBA course that he's doing at Monash University. Uh, obviously, Putra is very ambitious. Um, all right, thank you, Putra. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, with the next slide. Uh, so some of you will know that four or five, six weeks ago, maybe we sent out a questionnaire uh, to our users and we got about 200 responses, which as far as questionnaires go for software. Products is a pretty good uh, uh, response. And so we thought we, uh, you know, the heaps of stuff came back. So we thought we'd just feed back some of the more interesting things that came back in response to the questions and highlight some of the, uh, some of the answers that came back. Um, and just one of them here, so we asked people how often they use various components of biogas and the red box is the thing I want to emphasize there. Um, so for exploration, targeting, rock type, alteration, mapping, et cetera, spatial look at data, all good. Um, but one thing uh, that came back was not being particularly used, and I think people were saying not applicable, was some of the advanced um, multivariate statistical methods or even machine learning methods. Um, so that's interesting to us and really is a, is a reason why I think we need to run some more of these informal gas bag sessions. So next slide, please, Putra. Very much cherry picking some of the things that have come back. Um, what types of data are you using? Um, so soil stream sets, rock chips, drill hole data, uh, geophysical. So um, yes, the emphasis with our gas is looking at geochemical data, but man, you can you, it's very good dealing with geophysical data. Uh, structural data as well. We've got Nick on the line here and he's a great promoter of that. Uh, but interestingly, one thing that's really changed quite radically in the last few years is people are inputting spectral data in here. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know, some of you will know, but some of you may not know, uh, Index acquired OSPEC, so the AI series system um, from Sasha Ponchuel and Paul Gamson. Uh, we announced that just last week. Um, so you can expect to see a whole lot of development in IOGAS between IOGAS and AI Siri trying to further integrate those two products to make um, interpretation of spectral data with your geochem and your geophysics and your structural data uh, a much more seamless process. Uh, next slide, please, Pooja. 
Um, we asked what people would like in gas you know, to improve or new things to put in, um, and we've got lots of suggestions. Uh, so, and it's going to take us a while to summarise and get through these, but I'm going to show some of the highlights in here that we got back from the uh, got back from the questionnaire. But as always with gas, uh, if you send us suggestions in email, they are never ignored. They always they all go into the melting pot and we review them prior to embarking on the next dev cycle uh, in, in all cases. Um, so you can see those on the screen there, so under the analysis, attribute manager and calculations. Uh, so some of the things that people have suggested we're actually going to go out in new version 7.3, which will be out in two or three weeks. So under wavelets there, people suggested use the same color attribution across multiple plots. In fact, we've already done that. Uh, the next release will have a lot of general usability improvements in the attribute manager. Uh, in case I forget to say it, uh, with the next release 7.3, we're not specifically talking about that in this webinar because it's a gas bag um, <laughs> and we're not going to be bloviating about it. Um, but uh, there will be a, a webinar organised specifically around the new features in 7.3 in probably four to six weeks time, I would think. Um, and so in the attribute manager there, there are some things that we're working on. Uh, things that people suggested, um, other suggestions were quick calc. So there are some workarounds for that. So again, we ask that people just get in contact with some of these ideas, because sometimes we go back to people and say, you can do it now. In fact, sometimes people don't reason. Uh, and Megan, yes, we'll get to that. Uh, so next slide, Putra. Um, People have asked about the ability to edit data. So again, there is a bit of a work around there. Philosophically, uh, we regard I guess as being an end user of data that's already been cleaned up and come out of a database. I know that's quite idealistic, but that's been the philosophy behind gas for many years. Uh, but there are some workarounds. If you need to do some quick fixes, you can use the search and replace function to do that. Um, this was a new one to us and it's come up quite a lot in the last month, even setting all zero negative values to null. It's sort of the reverse case of the way we do it in the data doctor right now. Uh, we're going back to those people and asking them why they might want to do that because it's quite a strange workflow. Uh, imputation of below detection data, not missing data, but below detection data is something we're looking at for the release for 7.4, which is the release immediately after 7.3. Um, Next slide, please, Pudra. Um, some other things here that people are asking for are possible already as well. So uh, one thing the message hasn't gotten out, out about, I think, is that you can append new data into GAS. So there is an append function. Uh, and if you're using templates, you can easily apply a template to the data after you've appended data. And in fact, that turns out to be a a workflow which is really quite usable here and now. And I think we'll have a look at least at using the templates when Putra takes over. Um, interestingly, we've got more support for hyperspectral data where you can bank on that now that's going to happen. And also last files will certainly happen. Uh, under general over there, there are every release, we put some more global settings in and that's no different with 7.3. Processing speed, we're always looking at little tweaks in there about how we can improve that with release to release. Um, and a user forum. So we, um, <laughs> so, sorry, reading the comments. Um, so the user forum is something that we're very keen to get going um, and would love feedback around what people consider to be a successful user forum. Uh, you sort of only get one go at doing that properly. And if it falls over, people don't come back to it for a few years. Uh, but we'd like to know if, some, if someone, if you, the listeners, um, use a forum around a software product that has a user community and the users interact with each other effectively. Uh, you know, we'd love to, to know about it. We've looked at some ourselves, but we want to give, have, um, have the greatest chance of this succeeding the first time. Uh, some people even run these forums through LinkedIn, which I'm not personally not that attached to because I think LinkedIn is the most ugly user interface on the planet. Um, anyway, that's something we're looking at uh, post the immediate release and how to do that. Uh, next slide, please, Peter. Uh, interoperability. So in the next release coming out, there would be a Python link. Uh, it's very flavor of the month in the analytics world. So 
those of you who are deeply into Python and complete dorks will be able to play with that. Um, another bit of interesting news, which I think will excite many of you, is that we will be building a live link into QGIS. So that was um, so when you update the attributes in GAS, they will change in the QGIS um, GIS in real time. Um, Batch processing variable maps uh, has been improved and upgraded in the release, which is out in a couple of weeks. That was already underway. And some of those other things we are looking at. Uh, and, and also, Megan, just, just to answer your question. Um, so the uh, items that we're showing in yellow, um, so they're the ones that have been requested um, quite a fair bit through the questionnaire. And the ones in red are the ones that we are, will be including in the next release or we're working on adding into the, um, the one after that. So if that answers just your question. And if I'm squinting a lot, it's because the answer window in uh, in GoToWebinar, the, the font size, what you're typing in is about four point. I think it's actually quite difficult to read. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, other questions we've had about the the software. So cal calculated mineralogy. So yes, gas does do uh, CIPW norms a couple of different ways already. Um, if people really want to get specific about what they'd like to see, I mean, even getting to the point of using some linear methods or solver-based equations, that sort of thing, uh, we'd like to hear it because it's something that's been on our own mind uh, for quite a while. Um, provided resources over there coloured red and yellow, um, Whenever anyone makes a suggestion about a type of calculation, an index, or a pre canned diagram, a classification scheme that they want to see, then by all means, just send them through. Uh, the interesting thing about that is when we do upgrade that system, we can deploy that to all of the gas users with, without doing a release cycle. So we can just make them, we can update them over the web uh, whenever we want. I mean, we don't do it ad hoc, but we certainly don't need to wait for a new release of gas to come out. Uh, next slide, thanks, Pudra. Uh, and yes, QAQC. Um, we, we are getting asked this uh, increasingly. I have a little bit of a philosophical issue, or maybe it's too strong a word, but uh, QAQC, data, it's sort of a, it's a different mindset and a different workflow. Um, but yeah, keep, keep asking and then it might eventually uh, find its way into gas. Uh, QAQC data is typically also uh, also um, relational in nature, so structuring it in gas is a bit of a is a bit of a challenge. Uh, I'll come back to some of those questions when Pooja is working through the demos. Uh, next slide, please, Pooja. Um, so this is interesting. So we suggested a few things that we might prioritize in working. So calc min, I guess, viewer downhole compositing, imputation, and workflow automation, uh, and I think that just illustrates our gas user base is so broad now that the the preference was com virtually even um, across all of those different things, which is fine. So we, we've we learned something from that. Uh, next slide, thanks, Pooja. Um, this is a swap around since the last time. So the last time we asked this question, the dominant answer was less than 10,000. So it's a way of the world. Most people are working in data sets between uh, 10 and 100,000 rows. And now, in fact, we have users that are working on really quite large files. So greater than 100,000, quite a low threshold. People are data, taking data out of block models and things like that. But we'll talk about some tricks for handling large data when Putra takes over. Uh, next slide, please, Putra. Um, and on that topic, um, and Putra will show you when we get there, but there are different IOGAS executables which will take more memory and are able to handle much, much larger data sets. Yeah. Um, this has also changed since we last asked this question. I think last time we did this map info discover was by far and away the dominant uh, GIS application that people were using. Um, and QGIS didn't exist actually, but now you look at that and QGIS is getting up towards 40% of the GIS user base. And surprisingly, Arc, we thought ArcGIS Pro would have taken over the Arc Map user world, but not really. Um, that's a bit of a problem for us because with the 64-bit 60 bit version of GAS, we can't talk directly to Arc Map when we do Dev anymore. Only ArcGIS Pro 
um, which actually means that as far as integrations go, QGIS is now for IOGAS the largest um, GIS user base that we talk to. Um, and that's quite timely um, seeing, <laughs> don't you guess, yes. Um, that's quite timely seeing that we released the live update to that. So I think we guessed that one well. Uh, next one, thanks, Pooja. Uh, and then the, the next question there was is sort of also prescient because none of this was public domain. What would you be interested in integrating IGAS with? Um, R is there, but you know, slowly the Python dev world or analytics world seems to be gobbling up R. Uh, so this release, before we ask this question, actually does have a connection through to Python. And I've just, I've already spoken about AI Siri, which was part of OSPEC. So that will be in the hands from now on. Uh, and there's just the point about the forum. Um, we're keen on the forum. We'd welcome any feedback on how to best set up the forum because you know, we want it to be a tool, not for us, but for all of our users. Um, and then other products. So it's sort of interesting that I just highlighted the easy gamma there because one of the workflows in gas is applying wavelets to thing to downhold data. And the gamma logging tool provides really high resolution downhole data and it's very amenable to apply wavelet tessellations to which gives you an auto log so you can virtually go out to the drill core with with the log uh, sorry with the with the geology pre-logged and use it as a guide to speed up your logging process um, uh, in the field uh, siu log <laughs> septic services sort of it's a fluid it's a closed loop fluid recirculation system sumpless diamond drilling there you go it is a bit septic all right, next question. Thanks, Pooja. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Pooja now, who's actually going to run through uh, no more PowerPoints. Pooja is actually going to run IOGAS yeah. Live, go through some useful things that you may have forgotten exists in the existing version of GAS. We're not talking about the new release here. These are things that you all have here and now. Uh, and as Pooja's talking, uh, I'll butt in every now and then and answer the questions you have over in this window, which is in about, I reckon it's three point actually. Yeah. Unbelievable. Thanks, Dave. Um, so yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, so I'm just going to run through, you know, some of the things um, that probably you didn't know you can do in 7.2.1. So I'll just start off with, with, uh, with the GUI uh, sort of side of things. So, you know, people might complain that if you have lots of windows open, and, and you see that the font are really small, especially if you're, you know, these days using like 4K monitor and things like that. Well, what can you do to make that better? And the best way that you can do that is really in using a font pumper that we've included in the home ribbon. So if you go under settings, if you go into the extra large option. So this is a way that you can um, sort of make the access value a bit bigger just with the one single shortcut. Um, so that's one thing. And then what probably you didn't know you can do is you can assign a text label next to each data point. So whereas before you were able to, you know, just set up a, a text column as a label information. So if you hover over a data point and, you know, most of you would know, already know how to do this. So you set the select labels from, you know, next to the select variables dialog and you can change the labels to a text or categorical or even numerical column. But what we can do now in IGAS is whatever is selected in a select labels dialog or anything that you have selected in the sample ID field, you're able to use that as an item label right next to each of the data point. And what's really cool about this is, so if you have a plot of zinc versus um, FV203, and then you wanna see the assay value for another element in here, what you can do is instead of showing the regular unit as a label, you can instead have maybe TIO2. So you want to have titanium assay uh, displayed uh, next to each data point. So sort of like a multi-dimensional um, aspect to it. So you can um, do your interp and everything else. And then you have uh, a more visual label right next to each data point. And that sort of helps, I think, in some workflow. Um, and one thing that I would want to say about the GUI is if you don't like the default colors that we use, so say for example, um, 
this is the default you know coloring scheme that we use in gas but if you want to use something else for example um, you can go to the file settings and under general settings uh, you can choose to use um, our old you know default coloring scheme so if you've been using i guess for you know more than 10 years um, you would feel more at home with this color scheme and and depends on your uh, preference you can also select other um, color schemes as well and before before you ask it um, if you have requests for a, your own custom color sequence that's i believe that's in the list so um, it so is. Just it in fact, it, it almost made it almost made this release, but we pushed it off. But it'll be in the next release. Yep. Um, so that's the option. And then, um, so and another thing that I would want to say about the GUI is, say, if you really like to use the Data Doctor tool, you can add that to the favorites menu. And no matter where you are in GAS, you can just go to um, the favorites menu. Uh, see the star at the top. And then you can find it there. So I mean, data doctor might not be something that you use all the time, every time. So maybe something like, um, uh, let's say, maybe scatterplot, and and you, you know you want to access scatterplot once you're in the analysis ribbon, things like that, and you get that in the favorites, and there you go. You can just plot the that from the shortcut right there. So that's about it from the GUI side, and. And the next thing I want to talk about is mineral and rock nodes dialog. So maybe some of you don't know about this, but we're able to plot um, known mineral composition or rock composition on top of a um, any of your scatter plots. So for example, I got all, all my major elements here, and then I want to compare uh, the, uh, the composition of my sample and compare that with known compositions. So we have Carl Brohart's Osnaka database all in IOGAS here. So we've divided them into tabs of different deposit types. Um, so that's just from um, his data set. And we also have a whole bunch of different ORIA standards and uh, some uh, simple uh, Coxlet L igneous rocks composition as well. So this is like the sort of thing that you can plot on top of your data set and just to see if you're in the ballpark of you know known deposit and things like that do you have anything to say about this Dave? yeah so i've got a question here about plotting mineral and rock nodes on derivative plots and yes you can uh, yeah. so long as the chemical variables are aliased and you run a geochemical calculation or a geochem diagram so it might be a you might be plotting a ratio of two major elements to a to something else um, gas will still work out where to put the mineral node uh, despite all of yeah. that. Yeah, so, so, so like this, right? So if you look at a Pelspar sodium potassium GR diagram, so if you're looking at your fresh composition, there'll be, you know, probably somewhere around here. And, and that's exactly where you see um, your fresh rock composition. So your ry fresh rhyolite from the Coxet L database. So that's where, where they'll be plotting. plotting. And just really quickly, if I plot something, say from an epithermal deposit, and you can see, you can see that most of the epithermal rocks that they're plotting in sort of that altered uh, zones right here in the um, sort of the 0.33, so the, that Muscovite sort of composition. So that's where all your epithermal uh, nodes are sitting. So that's yeah one way that, and I really like to show this during the. Yeah, so Putra, that that's what you did there is really cool and important. Um, yeah. So, you know, Putra had a ratio there. He's got the potassium element, aluminium molar ratio and got the Muscovite node plotting there, opened up rocks out of the rock library, uh, which, and, you know, these aren't unique solutions. You've got to understand the mineralogy you're looking at. But if the K2A or budget is controlled by Muscovite, then you can see where it plots relative to that node. And with, say, you could have a, a chalcophile element on the bottom here and be looking at copper enrichment relative to muscovite, sericite development. Um, and then you might, might have actually been going to say, Puja, that um, if you've got your own alteration series of rocks, you know, I'll, I'll let you say, Puja. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so, that's, uh, so that's an important thing that we added in the last release of gas, actually, is that you know people who have been using this for quite some time 
they really want to know if they can add their own composition. And that's probably really useful if you're running an exploration program and you want to compare uh, the results of your latest um, exploration against um, what you know to be um, the, the good stuff, really. So, so, so what do you want? Well, what you can do now is you can add to this own list. Um, if you go in under the file ribbon, there's an option here called um, export to user notes. And this is a shortcut way of basically exporting your own data and exporting that into the library. So we might not have time to go through it, but basically you're able to add these as a new super tab at the top. And, and that's really cool because that means you can compare um, your asset results to what you know to be sort of like a, um, a, a type uh, for the deposit that you're looking for. Or even you know compare it to mineral composition um, if you're looking at that sort of data. Uh, so, so Pooja, there's some questions in the box here that um, yeah. I'm not sure everyone can see the can see the questions. So I'll read out a couple of them. Uh, so Ryan's asking, are you looking at developing capability to bring a JPEG of a diagram to sit behind an XY plot as a reference? Um, no, uh, but there are other tools in GAS to make the diagram. Uh, that you're looking at and so you just make the diagram directly so that yep. one that Putra has open there maybe you want to open up a colored in one Putra, just yep. the gen spot or something um, yep. so or something, uh, I think it just works yeah so we got the jensen so <laughs> you know diagram like this and, and you can make your own like diagram but i sort of get what you um what you mean ryan um so if you want to bring in a JPEG of a diagram uh, just to compare a composition. You can either choose to make your own or you can use that as a baseline for uh, making your own classification diagram. And I think that's that has been requested before. So sort of like a, like another GIS package where you use that as a basis for drawing your classification polygons and things like that. Uh, and the other thing we'd say, Ryan, is if, you, um, if it's public domain, it will do it for you. Yep, and, and put it into gas, which means it gets yep. maintained. Is the other thing. Um, uh, so Peter Findell, is there an option to drop the reference from the label of a rock? Oh yes. So there's so there's a few um, there's a few ways that you can display them. So so this is just node names and then node description, which is slightly longer, depends on the node itself. But there's a shortcut way of displaying it. So it's just display the um the name of the standard and a shortened name so there, there's a few ways that you can display them um but yes it it, it can look busy but it's the, the thing is with the latest release of gas we are able to um, resize this title um so that that should make life a bit easier to uh, turn on and turn off group and hide this somewhere where you don't want to see them quite clearly and um, but yeah yeah <laughs> So the, the questions are coming thick and fast, but um, uh, so and, and one of the important ones here. So if you're if in guy I guess if you use some of the fancy multivariate tools to build up a linear combination of input geochem variables, so a discriminant projection analysis or principal components analysis, then gas can project uh, the mineral and rock nodes into that new space. Uh, not all of those spaces though, for example, the TSNA, the st stochastic neighbor embedded tool, the math just does not work to embed a sample from outside the data that you use to create it in the first place. Um, yep. But where we can, where it, where it makes mathematical sense, yes, it will work, GAS understands what's going on. The diagram stores the linear equation used to project the data into the new space if you've done a PCA or a DPA. Uh, and then yep. James, James cleverly is asking nasty questions and he's one of us. <laughs> Do, <laughs> what's, image. what's a drone image in gas? No. Oh, okay, Pooja, sorry. Um, so, so I guess we should move on to the big data set and we can mm. show some, some of the workflow. Um, you know, some of the burning question people has about bringing a massive data set um so this one's particularly large but it's not as big as some of the data set our clients use so 16,000 rows and with a few variable columns um and what we want to show using this data set is basically a way to use 
uh, the random subsampling tool to make our life easier when you're looking at data set of this size. Um, so I'm just gonna bring that dialog up and I'm gonna select a 10% subsample. And this is a way for you to sort of, um, um, you know, it's almost like bootstrapping. Um, so it's a random stratified subsample. And if you apply this to this large data set, and if you run something like a self-organizing map, it's going to run, run much faster um, on this training data set almost. And then once once we reapply it to the rest of the data set, it's, um, it's, it'll be much faster after that uh, because um, essentially the process has already been done. So I'm just gonna use that variable that I selected. So just uh, some major elements. I'm gonna run the sum. And I already know a bit about this data set, so I'm just gonna whiz through it really quickly. And so while it's doing its thing, um, I've already assigned, you know, the filter into this data set, right? So, so if I hadn't done that, this process would take a bit longer. And so it's just a shortcut uh, way of running things, especially if you're, you know, look at, looking at data set with quite coherent uh, spatial distribution. And, and if you have good multivariate uh, sort of consistency between the data points. I thought the house was burning down and it's just my wife toasting herbs and spices to make a curry tonight. Nice. Um, so Dave, I'm just showing the, um, uh, the sum on that random subsample. Yep. So I'm gonna classify this using k-means. So you say forward stuff, so I'm just gonna waste through this. Um, so assigning colors, but what's important to know is that I apply it to the filter uh, data set. So just a small subset of the of the data. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn everything else back on. And this is quite cool to see. And I just turn on the attribute map just as a preview. So this is data set we're dealing with. But as we turn everything else back on, so I'm just gonna... So basically what we're dealing with is just that random subsample, uh, about 10%. And everything else is like this. So I'm going to minimize that and apply a sum to all rows. And it shouldn't take too long. And basically, once that's done, is I apply the result of the self-organizing map to the rest of the data set in you know in in way less time than if I do the process from the start to the entire data set as a whole. And this data set is a really cool example because um, just using this selection of elements. I was able to uh, separate out between uh, the regolits at the top and, and the iron ore uh, rocks at the bottom. So this is obviously an iron ore deposit data set. So if you're asking yourself the question of, you know, can, can I import 20 million rows of data? So for example, if you look at geomet data and that sort of thing, you, you can, and, and we do provide, you know, the ways to deal with that more elegantly than looking at them from the get-go, but I do understand that there are some people who want to look at clusters of data set as a whole, but if you're using this sort of workflow, this is what we can do to help speed things up, but yeah. And we're always doing things in the background to improve the way that we um, do things in, I guess, to make them speed up, things like that. So that's with um, our large data set example, if you have anything to say about that, Dave. Uh, yeah, so... I mean, that was a relatively trivial example. Was it 16,000 rows or something? But if you had, you know, obviously if you had 100, 150,000, 200, 500,000 rows, uh, you could, and if you're in extremely repetitive exploratory mode, then you could pick a random subsample out of there. And then you can, if you're looking at something and wondering if the relationship holds, you can actively resample the data and see if the relationship hangs together. Um, the other thing is, and we don't have time to go into this, but with this method of dealing with a random sample of a large file, you bring the data into GAS. Uh, there's another way, and you might be able to show, just show the button up yeah, there. That's right. yeah. yeah. So if you've got a really giant <laughs> data set, um, mm -hmm. and people really do have sometimes over half a million, some millions of samples, then you can randomly sample that without importing the data, all of the data into GAS. So it will generate the random data from the file yeah. on the disk, right? So it's actually 
that's actually quite quite clever. Um, but just remember, if you use that, then the other data is not in gas, right? It's it's outside of gas. Uh, but for some, especially for some modelling workflows, that's a valid thing to do. If you're looking for anomalies in an exploration program, I highly, highly recommend not doing that. Um, who's to tell uh, that you haven't left your anomaly behind on the disk? Ryan has so a wait, before before you get going. So Ryan's got another good question here. Yeah. Yep. Uh, is there another work? Is there a workflow builder during the next version layer user to automate a multi-step Scott Scott Halley type interpretation? Uh, close, and it's we have elements of it put together already. Uh, and but what we're looking at uh, for the next release, and not the release that's out in a couple of weeks, but the one after that, is potentially nested diagrams. So the data flows through one diagram into another diagram into another diagram, and then we filter it back and give you the answers, although you've just done all of those steps uh, manually, um, <clears throat> which I think is the workflow, workflow which is yeah. the workflow you're looking for. But yeah, but Ryan, uh, please, you know, if you've got any ideas around that, then please don't hesitate to get in contact. So I'm just going to show uh, the regression line example, Dave. Mm -hmm. uh, just keeping so an eye on the time, Putra, so you've yeah, got right. your yeah. yeah, that's 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 all right. That's all right. Uh, we just run this through quickly, and then and so we'll run through this example of regression line, and and I guess basically what we're trying to show here is if you apply this is and this is going back to that random subsample example. And, and seeing how that affects uh, the re regression line once we um, apply the random subsample is that it doesn't really change the regression line because um, because you're essentially just looking at a random subsample. Um, so this is just using a different seed number each time. And, and you see that the regression line uh, doesn't really change at all. So it maintains that consistency um which which shows you the value in using uh the random subsample tool for um for some workflow as um just just building up on that uh, workflow that we showed with the large data set so yeah um and now i think we're going to look at some of the more advanced things uh using the card tool so classification and regression tree so that is just gonna bring that up So we've we've showed quite a bit of this in the webinar video for um, I guess 7.2. So just with a classification and regression tree example, but we're just going to show that quickly because it's it's a really cool workflow. So this is Dave's thesis data, and and there and there's one group in here that's um, that we're not sure of the of, of its provenance. So that's the one with the question mark in here. So we left that as invisible. Uh, by design, and and we're just going to train our classification tree using um, Chalco file elements. So if you don't know about this already, um, if you go under the select variables list, and if you click under the provider drop down, and if you go down to the Chalco file list in this um, list, you can just select them, and it'll just select all the elements that's provided in in that particular list. So it's it's just a shortcut way of selecting from say if you're looking for porphyry mm -hmm. type deposit, we have that list of Pathfinder elements um, um, laid out for you. So it's a, it's a shortcut way of selecting them without um, finding them one at a time. And maybe one thing that will be quite helpful is um, this is something that we've had at last release I think. Uh, so if you right click on this, it will sort things out um, alphabetically, and and it um, and it sorts by your text column, your numeric column, and then by um, alphabetical order. So I just thought that's a really cool way to find things. Otherwise, you can get lost uh, trying to find the element that you want to select. So I got all this Chalco file element selected, and we're going to bring back the classification tree option. So we just left everything else as default. And as we run the classification tree, so it, this is pretty much the equivalent of, um, you know, you, you already know the classification uh, for 
uh, most of the data points in here. And then we're going to use how our data set has been classified on this. So copper less than uh, 501 ppm and silver less than 1.5 ppm corresponds to um, the silicon carbon iron stone. And then we can use you know, this sort of classification to predict uh, the provenance of unknown samples. So if I click on run, run three on all invisible rows, you can see that the, that the samples that I set to invisible, uh, which is the copper gosson question mark neo group, um, they actually belong to the Cypress neo uh, group of rocks. And that's, that's one workflow how you can uh, classify sort of in unknown composition in your, in your data. So, so another way that you can use this is say if you have a whole bunch of um, lithology groups, and if there's one lithology group or a bunch of rows that you're not sure what they belong to, and if you're confident about the, um, you know, the lithology of everything else, um, you would just have that uh, group of rows set as invisible like this, and then you run a workflow like this to predict sort of where they belong to in that sense. So this is another version of a discriminant projection analysis workflow. So if I run that quickly, and this is something that we've done before in the past. So Putra, I'll just um, yep. drop in there. So with the classification and regression trees, one of the really good things about them from a geoscience point of view is they're visual, it's great for geos, uh, but also that <coughs> it's, <coughs> I'm still choking on the herb, on the cooking spice smell. Um, they're visual <coughs> and they're non-parametric. Uh, so the distribution of the input data is irrelevant. It's just based on a series of binary decisions around the input data. So you can see the decisions there. So if, if copper is um, <coughs> less than 500, it goes down to the left, but if it's greater, it goes down to the uh, right. Um, so you don't need to worry about that is the point that I'm making, whereas the distribution of the input variables does have a material impact on most of the other multivariate techniques. Yep, and, and we'll touch on that in a bit, yeah. With the list of transformations for um, analysis tools. Um, and we'll talk about that closer to the end. Thank you, Kutra, I just need to butt in and answer some questions again, because it's just faster yep. than trying to type them. Um, yep. <clears throat> yeah, so Helen, uh, data measured on different intervals down holes it is a problem, it's a compositing problem. We've not really worked out a really cool way of putting it together, especially when uh, like hyperspectral data measured at great density down the hole, for want of a better word, and then an assay interval of two metres. Combining them together is a is just one of those things that's quite difficult to do, I think, rationally, uh, or, or in a general, in a generalizable way, I think is the better way of putting it. Um, <clears throat> And then Takalani is asking, is there a way to add a new column to the data table for minerals I interpret in IOGAS? Uh, so if you're talking about adding, adding, uh, <laughs> uh, if you, sorry, there's a football score podcast. If you're talking about adding a new minerals, um, you can't add new minerals yourself to the mineral library, but if you let us know, we will put it into the library. Yeah, but, but, but I think the colony may be mentioning something yeah. about um, if if you're say oh, sorry about what you mean. So if you plot something like um, um, maybe not with this data set. Um, so in that example that I showed you earlier with the um, GER diagram with sodium um, versus potassium over aluminium, if you got something like that and you want to say that a whole bunch of data points correspond to Muscovite alteration. So you can you can add a color group based on that. And what you can do is you can make variable from color. So this is a way for you to reuse your classification that you've done manually using your color groups and you add them as a new text column in your file and you can reuse them so you don't have to do the same workflow again. Um, that's what you mean. Can you compare two or more trees to know the accuracy of your model on the card. That's not a question, Dave. Yeah, that's a trick question because that's from Francis. He's one of us again. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, there are, there are, there are uh, cross-validation tools uh, in the trees, which you can run, you know, leave one out yeah. and that sort of thing, Francis. Uh, yep. And there's also, you can run the same thing with the uh, random forest. Um, 
Um, so I was showing the uh, another way that we can sort of repeat this uh, same workflow. But if you're if you're concerned about um, some of the methods, so you know this, this is another way that you can use it. So you you can use something like a canonical variant analysis or you know discriminant projection analysis as we call it in gas, and that will output um, discriminant projection columns based on your color groups. So it maximizes the separation between your a priori groups, and then you, and then you plot them up in and something like an auto domain diagram. And then you can use this to predict the composition oops, um, of the rocks that you you know know, uh, know to be you know unknown. And you can see sort of where the unknown samples are plotting, and they've been classified in in the Cypress Neo to and Fault Copper Neo to some extent. And yeah, that's just another way of running things in gas. So there's there's multiple ways that you can approach a problem. Essentially, that's the that's the takeaway point. Uh, so I'll just, uh, Helen's asked a follow-up question. Um, yeah. yeah, no, so at the moment, you can, no, Putra will have to check what I'm saying here. Uh, so at the moment, when you alias the input variables, just using silicon as an example, and, and if a calculation wants silicon, it, it'll only use one alias column at a time. Now, yep. I think in the current version of GAS, if you go and re-alias it, it shuts all the windows. But in the new version, Putra, have I got this right? Well, so in, you in, in, alias, it'll leave the windows open. I'm well, if you sure. if if you change any of the aliasing for the columns, so if you change mm -hmm. anything here, it's going to close all of your windows down because it's um it's a stability thing um, because you're changing the structure mm -hmm. of yeah. your data basically. So that's why yeah. gas mm -hmm. wants to close everything. But if if you just come in there to take a peek, um, so in the last couple of releases, we basically made it so. You can you can go in here and check how you have alias everything, including what columns you use in the special columns, and what columns you have alias um, in the list without having it close everything down. Whereas before, like in version seven or six point three, and before, uh, if you click on column properties, it just whacks everything out. Um, and even though you just want to check what you alias things as things like that. Yeah, and Helen's asking a question. I just think uh, alias based on some other metadata, um, yeah, would be quite difficult, I think. But but please email us about that, and we'll think about it. Um, yeah. And Ryan, more filters in the attribute manager. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's a popular suggestion actually. Um, if you've got the sort of brain to keep track of multiple filters, <laughs> that's the other thing. Um, when we first put that filter tool into gas, um, we got a lot of people contacting us to say gas wasn't working uh, because they couldn't see their data and they forgot they had the filter actually invoked. Um, but yeah, yeah, but good point. We, it's come up, and we're going to look at it because we could potentially have a chained filter. Um, I'm pointing at the screen, but a, a chained filter that appeared in the attribute manager. We've actually, in fact, the next version of gas on it, we're not meant to be talking about it, but um, because of the previous problem, if you have that filter invoked, that it, there's some even more obvious warning messages coming up, just reminding people that you're not going to see a big chunk of your data file. Uh, right, so some more questions here. Uh, can you show how to append data? Helen, O'Keefe, uh, if you... Hmm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we can. I'm just, <laughs> yeah, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just looking for one. Bobby, for Helen, to, yeah. Just like, but hey, Helen, um, send us an email. We'll get back to you and show you how to do it. And thank you, yep. other Helen, for you will email us about that. Um, yep. Sliding filter, um, interesting, Stuart. Um, in the next version of Gas, we have a hot selector which is getting close to that. <laughs> and sliders have come up in relation to the hot selector. So again, we will, we're will we going to keep this chat and it will be there. Um, one of the programmatic limitations with sliding things is gas can have so much data and everything's linked to everything else that if you're sliding and changing an attribute, then it can bog the program down. But that doesn't mean that we wouldn't do it. I personally like sliders as well. 
Yeah, no, they're, they're they're cool stories, and <laughs> and I think yeah. this is not the first time you ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but the the flash highlighting tool is, is getting towards that. And, but anyway, that's the next webinar. I'll shut up again, Pooch. Yeah, um, and I think in terms of um, tips and tricks of the current version of gas, I think I think I pretty much covered all of them. So if we can move to uh, talking about back to the prism. Oh, yeah, so uh, Putra, the um, good Scott asked oh, about the template. Oh, uh, yes, template. So, uh, so that's a so good Megan, point. Yes, we're going to do that now. Yep. In fact, for two reasons, to illustrate that how the templates work and that how it almost works as a workflow, but also to show you the um, tools we have in Gas Now for looking at AI Siri outputs. Yep. From so, the auto. So, um, yeah, so this is an Osiris um, demo data set that's been given to us by Sasha. So it has all the columns that's outputted from their system. And what we have in GAS are a whole bunch of diagrams that can be used to uh, classify them based on your spectral data. And then, but we also have templates that contain source diagrams and a few other um, ancillary plots as well, so like box plots and scatter plots. So you can find them from the file ribbon. And if you look under the Cyrus option, uh, you'll see what you can bring up mm -hmm. using your um, alias data set. So one thing to note about the Osiris data is that um, it's not alias yet. So most of these, so most if not all of these ones are free free diagrams and um, so so they require exact column names, but that shouldn't be a problem if you get data straight from the Cyrus system. But I'm just gonna bring one up now and I'll, and I'll show you what I mean. So this template contains uh, one of the Cyrus diagram and a histogram. And then another one that we can open up using this data set is a chloride um, XY plot. So this will just bring up another diagram, so a Cyrus chloride type diagram, and with a couple of scatter plots and probability plot. And one cool thing that you can use with this is you can, of course, because it's a Cyrus diagram, you can color rows by polygon. And then you can see it reflected in all of your data rows and then see it reflected in the template as well. So it's almost, as Dave said, it's a workflow. And to answer um, someone else's question uh, earlier on, you can, um, you can assign these colorings as a new color group. So you can do that by going to the data ribbon and clicking on make variable from color. And so it's gonna create a new categorical column. And if you look under the data menu, if you look to the very far right, you'll see that it's created the new categorical column that you can use to classify your data points. So you don't need to repeat the same process again. Um, so just jumping off that a bit. Um, so basically you can use that to reclassify your data that you've auto attributed using this, but yeah. And you could push that across into leapfrog and model it spatially, things like that. Yeah, that's that's right. So if, if some of you have attended the um, leapfrog geo webinar that I did last week, um, one thing that I showed quite heavily in that webinar was any text column that you made in IOGAS. So any new text column that you make in IOGAS while the link is active, it's automatically back flag into the Prog Geo. And that applies to classification you make using our advanced analysis tools. So if you apply attribution using k-means clustering or um, um, the results of a TSNE that you cluster, and you create them as a new text group, it's going to be back flag into the of Geo. So you're using the powerful workflow that we have in GAS and you can model them in other packages as well, basically. Yeah, Pooja, I've just got a question from Peter again about, uh, we can't automatically push it into Micromind, but when you write those columns into GAS, you can send them out of GAS and read them into Micromind. Yeah. It's just yep. Um, oh, now, uh, so Nick's asked another question. So the the IOGAS leapfrog thing, we have a, it, it's it's available, isn't it, Putra? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so I think um, we're going to be putting that up on our website uh, shortly. 
Uh, so we do have recording of that for anyone who's missed it. And and Nick, I'll, I'll just send you an email with the link to the video. Cool. All right, Pudra, it's getting close to your MBA time. So. <laughs> um, so we'll just jump back to the presentation. So we, we've covered pretty much most of this. Um, and one thing that I want to emphasize is that um, if you're struggling to open a large data set in GAS, a workaround is to use our other executable files. So maybe some of you may not know this already, but if you look in the installation folder for iGAS, there's these guys. So you have the standard iGAS 64-bit XE, and then you also have a whole bunch of um, things here called 1G, 2G, 3G, 12G, and 24G. And what does that mean? Uh, basically, the G uh, stands for a gigabyte of memory that um, I guess will use uh, when you're running this uh, particular executable file. So the 6424 gig XE will utilize up to 24 gig of RAM on your computer. So if you have a particularly beefy computer and you want to open a large data set, uh, this is what you can use to open up your file. Uh, so if you're trying to use uh, the normal XE to open a large data set, uh, you'll get an error message saying some rows at the end were skipped. So if you get that error, you just go to the installation folder and you um, click one of these ones, but you know, just bear in mind of how much RAM you have on your computer. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, buyer beware running the 24 gig build uh, of gas, and only if you have enough RAM and really have a need to do it. Yeah, um, I mean, you, yeah, you, you you can run the 24 gig, even if you don't have the 24 gig XE, it's just, the computer is going to suffer a bit, especially if you're running other beefy programs. Mm -hmm. uh, so Mark Arundel had another question that if you have, if you've lined up the AI series data with SA data, yes, you can open a, a spectral diagram using name matching and a geochem diagram with the geochem data and color in between it. Yep, that's um, no problem. Yes. So, so, so I've actually tried that. Um, Mark with uh, with with Scott Haley's training data set that's up on his website. So he has um, a spectral data with some geochem data as well, and you can plot up the result of your uh, spectral data on top of your um, molar element ratio diagrams and things like that. And that's a really cool workflow. And then I think you're getting close to the end here, Pooch, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so so in yeah. seven point three, just as a um, highlight of uh, or, or sneak peek of what we're going to be putting in. I mean, we've, we've covered pretty much most of this, um, but but um, yes, yeah, so we'll be adding a, a, a Python add-in. I think we've already mentioned that and some improvements on the QQ plot. And, and we're going to be increasing the column limit and attribute manager color shape size limit. So how many um, unique <coughs> items that you can use in the attribute manager. And QGIS Life Link, that's coming up as well. Yeah, and then just the last comment here, I think here, Pudra, before we sign off. Yep. Right. <coughs> so, um, so some feedback we're getting from people, and it goes back to one of those survey questions: is uh, people? I mean, GAS started off as an exploratory data analysis system, but now actually has quite a lot of multivariate and machine learning type techniques, so some modeling methods in it. Um, and how you use those, so the results you get out of applying, so a discriminant projection analysis, uh, a principal components, a self-organizing map, the various clustering routine, routines, stochastic neighbor embedding, uh, the answers you get from many of those things are in a, in, uh, in a, in a great way influenced by the transformation of the input variables. So the shape, the range, and the center of the input variables all affects those things, um, not even subtly different, actually radically differently. And if you don't understand how to do that or, or what its impact is, you can actually get quite um, strange or bogus results. But if you get it right, then those methods can be unbelievably revealing around the structure in your data to repeat to reveal alteration, rock types, <coughs> excuse me, things like that. 
Uh, so one thing we're going to look at for the next release, the 7.4, not 7.3, uh, is, uh, is a tool a bit like uh, the data doctor. Uh, so the data doctor, you just throw your data in and it's uses 20 or 30 years of experience to clean it up. Uh, so here we're thinking about actually having almost, I wouldn't call it AI, but something like AI, gas that says that it looks at your data and says, if you're going to run a PCA and a SOM, then we recommend that you pre-process the input variables in this way to give you the greatest chance of getting a rational outcome. Um, and so, like I said, it'd be 7.4, but if, um, um, so that would be the analysis doctor, but um, yeah, shorten the name of that at your own peril, of course, um, a bit like the data doctor. Uh, but that's something we're looking at, looking at putting in, and we'd be interested uh, in any feedback around that. Uh, Data mosaics, please fill up e email email us uh, about that. And watch out for QGs. Yes, Nick. <coughs> um, so anyway, we're, I, we're our hours up. Uh, the promise at the start of the gas bag was to run gas bags more regularly than every ten years, um, and I think we will run them every couple of months and emphasise um, emphasise different things. And, and Mark Arundel's just making the point there. That, uh, you've seen so much rubbish principal components analysis, and and absolutely that's true. And uh, you know the old adage and excuse the French shit in shit out um, really does apply when when using some of these methods. The only one where you can forget about it is the classification and regression tree, where the where you don't need to worry about that, but you do need to have, worry about having extremely good uh, training data. Um, just to emphasise, any questions, anything, uh, please send us emails. Where I can guarantee they all get read. You may not hear back from us, but they all get read and they all go back into the melting pot. And just be careful though, because if you send us a really good idea and we decide to implement it, you'll end up being the tester uh, as we're putting it in there. So you might get too involved more than you want. Um, the Putra has the, the website there. So if you want to go there and uh, there's lots of resources there. Uh, the emails about how to contact us are built uh, into GAS as well. Um, and I think that's it, Pooja, really, for this yeah. for this GAS bag. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Watch this space for the next webinar, which will be about 7.3, the new release, and then there'll be a back GAS bag after that where we go back to this more um, yep. ad hoc um, experience for everyone. And uh, there are a few Geelong supporters on this call. They won't mean anything to people outside of Australia, but the cats are in front. So I'm going to go and watch the end of the game. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for your patience and attention, and please keep in touch.